Hello, I'm Judy Stiles. Thank you for joining us this week on Newsmakers. Well, as the new academic year gets underway at Missouri Southern, there are all sorts of activities on campus to prepare for students and faculty returning. A lot of things have been going on, though, year-round, and one of the most visible things being prepared are new facilities. And today, Bob Harrington, the Missouri Southern Physical Plant Director, joins us. Thank you for being here today. Glad to be here. I think we talked about a year ago about all these projects that were going to be getting underway, and now you kind of see that light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Finally. It's uh, been quite a challenging year or so with having four projects going at the same time plus all the regular work but they're coming out very very nicely. Is this the most uh, the largest number of projects that happen you know, at the same time on a campus? This yeah year? I think it is that the last one that we did was the health science building and the rec center edition at BSC were kind of going at the same time mm -hmm. but yeah this one had this year had four of them going at the same time so it so was a challenge. It took a lot of coordination and let's talk about how those projects were coordinated. I understand you took a different approach with the contractor even this year. Yeah actually on these projects we did what's called a construction manager at risk mm -hmm. and with that proposal with that kind of a project what we did is we actually hired the contractor up front. The contractor worked with the design architect uh, to ensure that what the architect was proposing was truly the most constructible way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times architects design for architect awards as opposed to what you really need mm -hmm. and having the contractor there uh, to question materials and methods and, and the way they go through the design process it really helps make it a much more efficient project. So efficient in terms of time as well as dollars and cents. I yeah, imagine. absolutely. Because again, they're questioning the constructability as they go through the design process. Mm -hmm. They can recommend different procedures or different materials that would do the same thing, but be more cost effective. The other thing with the construction manager at risk is when you're all done with the design process, the contractor actually gives us a guaranteed maximum price oh, okay. that we know exactly what that project's going to cost us. Mm -hmm. If it comes in less than that number of dollars, we got the difference. If it comes in more than that, they pay the difference. So the only changes to that GMP were actual change orders that we approved in advance and gave them you know, approval for additional cost at that point. So it sounds like a really a vital aspect of communication on this project. It is. It, it's very important. I said you've got the architect sitting with the contractor through all the meetings plus the owner. Mm -hmm. I sat in on every meeting and every construction update. and probably walk through the job sites three times a week to, to make sure where we were at. And it really, they turned, all four projects went very, very well because of that. It was a very good process. So did you have a little bit of tweaking on all those projects as you were going along? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, the uh, apartment complex itself, we had a fixed $14 million budget, which mm -hmm. was the bond issue that we had received to do this project with. And initially the bids came in 2.7 million over budget. And we ended up having to do what's called value engineering, and that's go back through the design process, make changes to the facility to bring it back into budget. And it, we actually, within two weeks' time, cut $3 million out of the budget on that project to get it back into budget. Just changing the way things were going to be built that, and structured. There was some, a lot of it was aesthetics, mm -hmm. uh, some of the looks of it. And quite frankly, unless you're looking at a rendering of what the original proposal was and the current facility, you'll never know the difference. I mean, there was things like each apartment had a balcony on it with a set of French doors going out to it. That got eliminated. Buildings D and E were originally down at the same level as the tunnel with the large patio kind of a courtyard, so that when you came out of the tunnel, you walked into this courtyard area with the buildings on either side. Oh, okay. Well, obviously, that took a great deal more of excavation to take those buildings down. Storm sewer, sanitary sewer were issues because you had to get it down low enough to make sure that everything still flows downhill <laughs> like it did. And one of the things we did was bring D&E back up to the same level as the rest of the complex, and then created kind of a grand staircase coming down to the tunnel with a sidewalk coming out of it for ADA compliance. So it was things like that that, that made it all work for us, mm -hmm. uh, and we got it back into budget, and it came out to be very, very nice. Well, on the residence hall, that area, that is a bond issue, so the students Correct. are then paying that back by living in those apartments. Correct. In fact, we looked at one point of possibly phasing uh, the project in, and it really wasn't feasible to do that mm -hmm. because it required basically the revenue from all 51 apartments that were part of the complex to meet the bond indebtedness. So uh, it was kind of, we had to do the whole thing. We really didn't have any choice, right. so <laughs> we had to make it work, <laughs> absolutely. Right. So we have 51 new apartments. Uh -huh. um, how many uh, students there's, with a house? There's 201 beds. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the apartments are four bedrooms. Uh, each bedroom has its own bathroom, and then each apartment shares a common living room 
with a common full kitchen, including a washer and dryer. Right. I know we'll be seeing video shortly, but those really those designs were a result of input from students and research. Oh, absolutely. We, we did, actually we did a lot of research with the architect and on our own, and and actually did some student surveys to find out what the student of today is actually looking for in the residence hall. And mm -hmm. what they really, really want is their own private area, but they want a lot of group space too. They want to be able to share space with their friends and, and be able to have that communal spirit, but they really like their own privacy too. So the concept of the bathroom and bedroom being combined and being private for them worked out very, very well. I imagine a lot of people who even live in town would say, I'd love to have my own bathroom. Absolutely. <laughs> have my own bedroom like that. So that will raise the overall campus capacity of the students? Right at 920 beds. Mm -hmm. And I understand if people have been watching the news, those new facilities filled up almost immediately. Hour and a half, from what I understand, they filled up. In fact, they said the only reason it took that long is they had a computer glitch while they were doing it. But <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of demand for them. And uh, the students watched them being built. Mm -hmm. So they got to see the whole thing going through the process of it. And we're very excited about it. And I think when you see the video and when you see the facility itself, the courtyard that ties all of the six buildings together is really going to become a great social space for students. Uh, we've actually put slabs by the sidewalks and we're putting picnic tables in it. Yeah. There'll be six major picnic tables right down through the middle of this courtyard and I think it's going to be a very, very strong social area for the students. Okay. So really you don't have that institutional look, it kind of has that homey feel, yeah, it's, you know, it's, the it's, community it, feel. The, the appearance of these buildings are totally different than anything else we have on campus. We tied the colors back in, so mm -hmm. it, it ties in with the nomenclature that we've got on campus. But actually, the buildings themselves are a totally different design. They're actually uh, a stick build. It's actually wood studs and sheetrock as opposed to block like most of our buildings are on campus, which is going to be a little bit more of a maintenance issue in a residence mm -hmm. hall for us. But by the same token, we've got a great deal more for the same amount of money by doing it that way. Well, let's take a look at the video and what some of the, we did. Obviously, we had a student, one of our students, go out and help us shoot some video one day, took a little tour of what you have in the uh, new facilities. You can see the exterior as you're talking, a lot of green space there in the middle. Absolutely. Of the space you got there was building A, and then you're looking back down now to B, C, D, and then F is the one on the left. And you can see the courtyard down through the middle, mm -hmm. which is what I was talking about. It's going to become a major social space. And all of the apartments have... Uh, an outside entrance just like a lot of the apartments in town. You can see we're just now putting the furniture in. There's hardwood floors. It's actually a vinyl laminate uh, type floor. The kitchens have got an island in each one of them that'll be that has four stools there in front of it. And these are kitchens equipped with the stove and the microwave actually, and the range. So Self-cleaning stove, microwave, mm -hmm. refrigerator with the uh, ice maker in them. Uh, like I said there's a washer and dryer in the closet there on the left you can see. These are all self-cleaning ovens. So they should be really nice for the mm -hmm. students to use. And then the, there's the island we were talking about. So there's a plenty of storage for students. If you have four Absolutely. students living in this apartment together, there's plenty of room. This is something that people may not realize. You have washer and dryer. In every apartment, there's a washer and dryer and their own water heater. So uh, like I said, I think it's going to be a pretty class act for our mm -hmm. students. And here's your room. You know, Of course, we didn't have the mattresses on the day we were there, but you can see the room set up. It gives them, each individual student has looks like plenty of room. They have a bed, a dresser, a desk, and a chair. Mm -hmm. uh, each room has a cable outlet. The bathrooms in each one of the bedrooms are very large. I think the students are going to be very, very pleased with these. And so they have the facilities and then uh, we're walking into another building, kind of an open courtyard inside here. In yeah, the, uh, between building A and then between buildings D and E, there's mm -hmm. a commons area, which is basically a three-story open area as you walk into the area and it's going to have additional seating and stuff in there. But it kind of makes it like some of the hotels, mm -hmm. you know, that you go into where you have that open atrium where you're looking down into the courtyard. Now this building is actually the FEMA shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, this is looking at it from the north or from the south end. And it's actually a tornado safe room. It's designed to hold 2,000 people. And when you go inside of it, as you can see, it's a big open area. Uh, but I see the students will plan to use this for all kinds of student services, student activities. I mean, you can see a career fair and those type mm -hmm. of items going on here very well. Our only requirement for it is we cannot put anything in that building that would restrict us from getting the 2,000 people in there in the event of a storm. Uh, so if we have something in there like a display, if there are mm -hmm. tables, it has to be something that can be pushed out of the way very quickly 
in the event of a storm. So that's a big new facility, and that one's over 12,000 square feet? Uh, it's about 12,500 square feet. Like mm -hmm. I said, it'll handle 2,000 people. Uh, we actually built extra bathrooms into it so that we could use it for student services and different mm -hmm. types of activities. Uh, so I think it's good that, again, that's going to be a nice facility for the students to be able to do things in. Uh, I can see picnics and those kind of activities right. going on in there with no problem. So with the 900 or so students living in the residence halls, that gives you room for people even on campus. Absolutely. The, uh, the way FEMA looks at it, it's anybody that can get to that shelter within five minutes. Mm -hmm. So you actually draw a circle from the location of the FEMA shelter to show what that five minute walking area is. And basically it entails Anderson Justice Center and it actually picks up Webster also. Whether or not people will actually go across the street and even mm -hmm. have a siren when you've got safety areas in the building itself is to be seen, but it, but it would accommodate them should that happen. And it's designed with the doors on it are tied into our alarm system. So mm -hmm. when our tornado sirens go off, those doors automatically unlock okay. so that if there is public or somebody that wants in there, they're not going to be locked out of the facility. It automatically unlocks to let them in. That's probably a question people who are watching from the public. If they live in the neighborhood nearby, you know, can they come over there and use that shelter? Yeah, and actually what will happen, uh, if we're under a tornado watch, that's when typically your people are going to start looking for shelter as opposed to when the warning hits. Right. Mm -hmm. So my expectation and the, and the plan that we're putting together We'll basically have either one of the campus police officers or somebody from student services, the residence hall staff, will unlock the doors and have it open in the event that we're under a tornado watch in the event that it goes into a warning situation. So you're on kind of standby in case Correct. something happens along those lines. A payment for, or paying for that building, that, you mentioned FEMA, so obviously uh -huh. the government helped with that. Uh, actually, that one was about a 75%, 25% uh, grant from FEMA. Mm -hmm. They pay for 75% of all allowable expenses. And by that, I mean, as an example, I said we had extra bathrooms right. in there. We've got actually stools, urinals, whatever, in the two restrooms for six people. All that uh, FEMA required for us was to have facilities for two people. So, what so they paid for two. We paid for the other five, basically, mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, you saw that there was a enclosure on the front, right. kind of a vestibule on the area. front. Mm -hmm. That's actually disposable. I mean, the event mm -hmm. of a tornado, that would probably be blown away because the actual doors to the shelter are inside that area. Okay. Uh, again, FEMA wouldn't pay for that, but that dresses it up, and that was some of the things that we were trying to do to uh, upgrade the facility. We upgraded the mechanical system, the electrical and the, mm -hmm. the heating and air system in there so that we could accommodate other events in there. Again, FEMA required it to be there. I mean, you're only going to be in it for an hour to two hours at the outside. Oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So that's all that they required. We upgraded all of that. That's where the university had to pay for the difference of it. To keep it running. You know, we had to pay 25% of the allowable mm -hmm. plus any of the extras, extras at that point. Well, what if the facility, as far as have a backup generator, you know, storms yes, come it through, does. knock it out actually, the power? It has a backup generator that's actually in a stormproof enclosure itself, mm -hmm. okay. which is required by FEMA. That, uh, As an example, when St. John's was hit by the tornado, it mm -hmm. took out their emergency generators because they weren't in an enclosure. So FEMA requires now when you build a shelter of this nature and you have and you have to have the backup generator for it, but it has to be in a, a stormproof enclosure itself. So, so it's actually in a block building with a steel roof on it to protect it. So it's it. going to stay there as well, Correct. continue to provide that electricity. So when I'm dealing with building a shelter and FEMA, you do have some specific guidelines you had to follow. Very yeah. specific. The, uh, I forget the actual code requirement. I think it was something uh, 51 that is their specific guidelines of how it has to be built and tied together and mm -hmm. everything to make sure that it is tornado proof. And we met every one of those requirements for that. And looking at the building and that view on the inside, you have some very sturdy beams and Absolutely. everything that's width of the wall, the ceiling, everything. It's all, it's all poured in place concrete and, and precast concrete slabs that were put up and then mounted with concrete uh, double post joist on the ceiling. So mm -hmm. it's not going anywhere. It's It'll be there pretty thing. secure. <laughs> right. So that will then add to that part of campus with the residence halls and that facility. When students come back, Correct. there's going to be a lot of activity over there and students moving in and putting that together. And basically those apartments are furnished and ready to go. They're yeah, there. they're absolutely ready to go at this point. I will send my staff through uh, probably the week before just to do any touch up, make sure mm -hmm. everything is cleaned up and adjusted right put a roll of toilet paper in the bathrooms, right. that kind of thing, to make sure that they're ready for the students. But they're, all the furniture's in them now. They're, they're basically complete. Uh, the contractor's still doing a couple of little things just to finish up the exteriors of the buildings. But inside, 
they're done and they look very, very nice. Yeah. And of course, the, the student services, those who run the residence halls, will have the spe specific information for the students on you know, rules and procedures and things like that when they move yes. in that day and tying into who's going to live in which room and all that. Correct. That out. So that's been a big uh, highlight, you know, working in Webster Hall across the street from that, just watching those buildings come up. And you say the whole campus has watched those buildings come Absolutely. up. Absolutely. The whole community has. The whole community has. We've like heard a lot of informa information from the community about it. Oh, yeah. So the community has been driving by campus, they've been seeing that. And then across the street, um, from Webster Hall to the east, you've been seeing the end zone facility going. Correct. Uh, that facility is also a year or so in the making? Yes, uh, we've been in process for it just a little over a year. Uh, it will be ready for football season. Mm -hmm. Actually, the building is complete now with the exception of the carpet and the main lobby. And we've held off putting that in until we get all the furniture in. And the furniture is supposed to actually start to be delivered this week on it to do that. So it's coming in, but they Got all the exterior of that done at this point. They're mm -hmm. just finishing up some of the site work on the far side of the parking lot, but the parking lot's done, the driveways are done, the building itself is complete. And that building's financing. Donors played a big role in that. Yeah, actually it was fully financed by donors. Mm -hmm. There was no university funding went into that one at all. And it was about a little over $8 million project. Uh, Freeman was a large contributor to that to help us with that. And it's in fact the training room downstairs is fully equipped to meet not only our needs, but also serve as a rehab uh, center for Freeman Hospital. So their intent is to use that as part of their rehab program also. Time back there. Now from the outside, when people drive by, they may not realize you do have, you said it downstairs, there's two yeah, levels Yeah, it's two there. floors. Uh, the ground level actually opens up right on the track and right on the football field. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's where the locker rooms are, the weight right. room and the training room is at that level. The second level actually opens from the north. It's at ground level on the north side where the parking lot is. And it basically has all of the offices for all the football coaches, the head coach, all of his assistant coaches. They have several conference rooms that they can hold team meetings in and they mm -hmm. can actually break the team down into any number of components they want to meet with individual groups to do that. Softball and baseball coaches' offices are in there. The athletic director's office will be in there. And then there's two large rooms. One of them we're calling an educational room, mm -hmm. and uh, it's large enough to seat, I think we can seat probably 250 people in a, in a dining situation in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's big enough to hold, set up tables and have classes in there for the entire football team, to have a team meeting in right. a location right by the stadium, which they've never had before. Mm -hmm. And then there's a second room that we're calling the alumni room, which has a catering kitchen with it which I think is probably where the president will have his VIPs and stuff watching the games because it's all glass front with a beautiful view looking right down the football field. And we'll be seeing that on video as well, but size-wise, give us the percentage of you know, square feet approximately. It's about 50,000 square foot total. Okay. So it's quite a sizable yes, facility. Yes, it's a real, it's a fabulous addition for us because it what it does is it eliminates the need for all of the athletes to dress out in Leggett and Platt and then mm -hmm. walk from Leggett and Platt across Duquesne to get to the stadium. It also has much better facilities for them over there. The facilities, you know, we had to bring in porta potties for the team and things like that because right. there never was enough facilities in our existing stadium to support them at halftime or something of that nature. The new facility meets all of those requirements. It'll be a, an excellent facility for them. I think it'll really help us on recruiting because again, instead of having to dress out over here and walk across the street, or if you want to have a team meeting, bringing everybody back over and bring them either into Webster or one of the auditoriums, something like that. They now have the space over there to do that on site. And that'll be ready for them when they come back to practice and for getting ready for the season. Yes, they start year. practice mid-August and mm -hmm. uh, we'll be totally ready for them. Okay. In fact, we're getting all brand new football turf also, which is being going down right now. Well, let's take a look at some of the things that people see over there. So we also have video of the athletic facility and the uh, north end zone field house. Uh, exterior view, you mentioned this is yeah. the ground level. Then you are Yeah, the this is looking from the, from the north, probably mm -hmm. northwest. Uh, the glassed in entrance is the main entrance going into the facility. Uh, the windows you see along there are for the athletic director's offices and the football mm -hmm. offices and, and baseball and softball there. Okay, so that's Obviously, Freeman signs on here as they were a major contributor to this project for us. Of course, Missouri Southern's identification as well. So Absolutely. People, you know, the lion and the re recommendation or signs for the university. So from the outside, it's going to be very recognizable that this is a new major facility for Missouri Southern. Absolutely. Looking at this room here, this the room that you're looking through now is the educational room. No, this is the, the uh, that's the alumni room. Alumni I'm sorry, room, that's right? the alumni room. Uh, main entrance desk, when you walk in the main door, this will be the desk. Uh, they're actually going to sell tickets to all the athletic events okay. and events on campus 
from this location now. So this will be the new ticket location for students. This room is the academic room here. Okay. You're looking out. You can see there's a terrace out in front of it. Mm -hmm. And everything is looking directly south right down the middle of the football field. So you won't miss it if you're at the games. No, <laughs> it's absolutely be right not. There. <laughs> uh, this locker room is the, this one looks like base. Well, that may softball be softball. Field? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. this is a softball locker room. Okay. So each, you know, sport has their own uh, locker Correct. room. And of course, the their facility shower showers rooms. within those facilities. And then uh, they're also closer to their fields as well. Absolutely. Baseball and uh, being on campus now as well. And of course, the, another locker room facility. We're just waiting for the athletes to. Yeah, this back one is ba this baseball. is the baseball locker room mm -hmm. here. Imagine the coaches uh, will appreciate having the team right there outside the door, ready to go. Now, Correct. Over this the football is football. Side. This mm -hmm. is the football locker room. And we uh, actually moved all the lockers over from the existing football locker room since they were just built about two years ago and put mm -hmm. in brand new. They're still in very, very good oh, shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So rather than trying to replace them, we just brought them all over and installed them over here. So they're ready to go for the players to show up. And then, as with any athletic facility, you have to, have to do the laundry. Washers and dryers <laughs> and everything for it. And there's actually a, a large equipment room that's just to the side of the fact, you can see mm -hmm. it here, that uh, the the storage is all the, it's, it's on track, so it'll all compact together. And then you can just open it up for whatever section you want to get into. Uh, this is the training room. You can see all the training the equipment, equipment at this point, ready to be in used. Place and, uh, Taping tables for mm -hmm. them to tape up the players before they go out to the games or after. And people may not realize how much of that is just part of the game process. You have Absolutely. to you know, line people up and have them ready. And our work. brand new weight room. Mm -hmm. And the weight room is glass on both sides. So it's actually glass on the field side oh, okay. looking out onto the field. And then it's glass on the interior wall for anybody walking through looking out can see all of the can weight equipment and look out to the field. The equipment. New equipment for all of the facility here for them to use. They yes. look like they're brand new equipment ready to use, the weights to lift. The existing weight room and training room and leg and plat will remain for the other, uh, the the other, other sports. sports. So mm -hmm. this one is just basically for football, baseball, and softball. Okay. So, and then the field. Uh, and you can see looking out, this is the new turf going down. Mm -hmm. uh, that was prior to them starting to put in all the logos, which they're doing right now. They're cutting in all the logos and the sidelines, but it's going to be a fantastic view looking out of that second story of that new facility that looking game, down that's there. It's going to be an yeah, end-zone view of the game, and the turf itself is going to be a nice addition to the field as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Something we needed again. And I think it's mm -hmm. going to, like I said, I think the whole complex is going to make it a really much stronger recruiting tool for us to recruit stronger players. Mm -hmm. Now the turf that we saw, I guess, has turf technology changed over the years? It was probably been quite a few years since we had the quote old, old turf. And yeah, in fact, the old turf had basically, it was all a rubber infill mm -hmm. inside the turf itself. And that turf we put down in 2003. And uh, it was getting pretty beat up and pretty packed in and pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And the new turf that's going down, actually the infill on the turf is a combination of sand and rubber. Oh, okay. So it, they found that it actually lasts better. And the one that we're putting down is called Momentum which has a longer uh, leaf on the grass itself so, so that like it stands up higher. Cut of a grass it, actually, it. it actually looks a lot more grass, wide grass than turf. Mm -hmm. And they chose to do it in alternating colors. So every 10 yards, the color switches from darker to lighter. So it, it's got kind of a really neat uh, impression looking that way. So it's going to add a whole new look to the game as well. Absolutely. And the uh, goalposts in the end zone? They're... We replaced those also. They, mm -hmm. uh, the old ones we had only had 20 foot uprights and uh, NCAA requirements now are 30 foot mm -hmm. upright, so mm -hmm. we changed those out to put the full size uprights in them. So really bringing things up to date and you know, those facilities ready to go for students Absolutely. and the athletes and so forth. Looking to the future, you're not ending construction. I know there's projects already being discussed. Uh, Reynolds Hall is a major project. Reynolds Hall is the next, you? that's probably the next big one we've got going on. Uh, we intend to remodel the first floor of Reynolds Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, that. Uh, First floor has five laboratories, four math classrooms, a computer lab, math computer lab, one tiered classroom, and four uh, faculty staff offices. And we've actually acquired the FEMA trailers that the high school used right. when they were at the mall that had their labs built in. They had all the tables with already equipped with the gases, water, mm -hmm. and, and the facilities that they need for lab. And we've acquired those, and those are being installed on campus right now back behind the physical plant. And that's where we intend to move the staff out of Reynolds Hall. We're going to clear out the entire first floor, move all the classes in that area so that we can we start remodeling. Because that building was built in 67 and was added on to an 83. 
we need to go back and now that we're doing that significant of a, a, a remodel in it, everything has to come up to code, which right. means we've got to put sprinklers in it, which it's never had, mm -hmm. new fire alarm system, probably upgrade the electrical, as well as the facilities themselves. So, so it's need, going to be a very significant project. So you need people out of there in order to yeah, do that Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> I have to tear the ceilings out uh, totally to put all the new piping in. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll probably change out the air handlers and put in far more efficient air handlers. Right. Uh, fan coil units so that we get better control in each individual area for the occupants of them. Better heating and cooling as opposed to technology that's 50 years 50 old years at this old point and <laughs> pretty old yeah so any timetable on when those projects will get underway uh, actually what we're anticipating we've now hired the architect we're going to start the design process uh, probably in the next few weeks uh, realistically we're not going to be able to physically move the labs out of Reynolds until probably the fall of 17 okay. we'll have them down there we'll actually move the math classes this spring mm -hmm. for the spring semester of 16 uh, they'll start occupying the trailers but there's so many built-in cabinets and stuff that are in the laboratories themselves that have specimens and things in that we need to move into the trailers that with the way our Christmas break keeps getting shorter and shorter plus mm -hmm. our break in the middle of it there, there's no way to make that happen. Right. So we've pretty well decided that what we're going to do is we'll do all the design work, we'll bid the project out so that it's scheduled to start in the summer of, of 17 and then we'll physically move the labs over that summer so by that fall they'll start out in the, in the trailers. And we're currently building a sidewalk that connects Reynolds Hall from behind BSC all the way to the staircase behind Plaster Hall that'll go right down to these trailers. So we're trying to make it as convenient as we can for the students to be able to get there. So your list of things has gotten a little shorter, but there's always something on the horizon. <laughs> always something going down the <laughs> Tying things together. I know your staff, physical plant staff, is very busy throughout the summer just with the summer routine of Absolutely. keeping Absolutely. So many things we have to do to try to get everything ready for the fall semester. You know, the residence halls, we've got to go through them. And there's a lot of repair and maintenance that needs to go on over there, mm -hmm. as well as all the academic buildings and stripping floors and refinishing floors and cleaning them. So they stay pretty busy. So kind of catch your breath when the students do get bad for you. Actually, yeah, while well, the students are gone, we actually do more work than we can while they're, while they're here, here. So, Well, Bob, I'd like to thank you very much for updating us, providing a chance for the viewers to see what's happening here on campus and find out what's happening. You're very welcome. Okay, well, thank you. And I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us this week for Newsmakers, and I hope you can join me again next week at the same time on the station. We'll see you then.